My pleasure to introduce Sandhya Shekhar. She is the young dynamic CEO of IIT Madras Research Park, a not-for-profit uh, driven to support entrepreneurial activity and research uh, combined with uh, commercialization of, of the research products. Um, Sandhya, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Um, you are a product of IIT Madras. You did your PhD from there. Before that, you have impeccable re academic resume. You did your uh, MBA from IIM Bangalore. Uh, so you were in some ways bulldozed uh, into uh, leading this effort at IIT Madras. It's a very interesting uh, project in its nature. So let me start by asking you, can I define what the research park is about? Well, um, for a long time now, um, a lot of people have believed that the potential of India in terms of what we can do by way of creating our own IP, creating our own products, has not really crystallized into something tangible. You know, while the IIT's claim to fame has been producing uh, graduates of, of fantastic quality, they have been the global suppliers of manpower. Um, this very same manpower has probably not been utilized to create the kind of R&D output and products and technology that, that could potentially be created within the country. Of course, a lot of this IP gets created in Silicon Valley and other parts of the world. And uh, people started thinking in terms of how do we create a strong IP portfolio within the country that can be used to solve the country's problems in a more meaningful manner. And uh, the apparent lacuna seemed to be the lack of engagement between the academic fraternity and the industry. So if you really look at the exodus uh, post a BTEC degree, uh, you know, most, most youngsters want to go to the US for their masters or PhD programs. The motivation seems to be that uh, uh, you know, if you go to universities abroad, it gives you a greater degree of exposure to the industry and you end up looking at problems that are business centric and business relevant. So this was a gap that one wanted to bridge and that was one of the motivations for the research park. Um, so we said, if we have to produce the kind of research that is meaningful in the current context, if we have to create products and technology that is relevant to the nation, one way of doing it is to co-locate industry next to the academic fraternity. Because the underlying premise is when you bring unlike minds together, you know, three sets of entities basically. People from the industry who have a keen knowledge of what uh, competition is all, all about, what markets are all about, what works and what does not work and you tra transpose it with the expertise of uh, faculty members who, who have deep-seated domain expertise but don't really care too much about uh, the markets and competition. And so they look for elegant solutions just for the joy of um, you know, looking at solutions without being fettered by what the competitor is doing. And the third element in this stride is the student. And, and you tap that potential not necessarily because of his knowledge or domain expertise, but because of his creativity, because of his ability to come up with intelligent solutions to problems and look at problems in a little different way. So you, you bring these three elements together and the hypothesis is that uh, the innovation cycle times can be reduced remarkably. You know, so, so your propensity to come up with intelligent solutions to real problems would perhaps be higher if you co-locate industry with the academic fraternity. So, so that, that has been the primary motivation for the research park. You know, it's very unique in its nature because all the things that you described are absolutely required in an emerging India. Uh, because the problems are multi-layered. You have a student body that are very driven, very focused, but they don't know how the research could be productized. You have the commercial interests who have obviously their own vested interests. So uh, whether they take or they do not take, the research is uh, a question that needs to be answered by them, which I think will improve in the years to come. Um, if, so if you look at the model in Silicon Valley, which is what everybody else is trying to ape, mm -hmm. uh, but they have been successful uh, you know, in, in, in very small ways and around the world. Um, so I think it has to be a cultural shift I mean, the dynamics are going to be in place, what you just described. Um, how do you think the mindset 
uh, if I start with the students, then you can take it to the industry, is changing looking at the world around them. Uh, in terms of a the kind of research required mm -hmm. uh, and the quality that goes into it mm -hmm. and then the 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 right support from the industry to productize that particular research and do it in a way that is beneficial for everybody that's that's an interesting question actually um, you know there are two facets to this and i think if any initiative has to succeed it is it is really predicated by what is the need that it addresses and how successfully it, it addresses. So, so to look at it from multiple stakeholders perspective, let's begin with the industry perspective because that's, that's really the catalyst to all of this. Uh, if you have to answer the question, what's there in it for me? You know, what's, what's the industry looking to do today? I mean, if, if there is one silver lining to the recent recession, I think it is the fact that there has been a shift of focus from market valuations to the need to create real value. And how do you create real value? The real value comes through innovations. You know. And if a lot of MNCs all over the world are gravitating towards India today, it is primarily because of two reasons. Number one, they see a huge market opportunity there. And number two, they are looking at the talent pool. So, you know, if you have products and solutions, you can't simply transpose it to a developing economy. It has to be contextualized, it has to be localized. So it makes enormous sense for them to relocate their R&D and innovation labs into a place like India, you know, and then see how do we capitalize on this market potential by using local talent to customize what we have. You know, so so that's, that's the reason the industry wants to engage with the academic fraternity because when you're co-located to academic institutions of the kind of uh, you know, IIT Madras and other institutions, you're essentially talking about the talent pool and how they can be utilized. So, so the industry is happy to be there, not necessarily because they want to leverage on existing research within uh, the institution, but because they want to see how to customize their offerings to the local needs. And, and frugal innovation is the need of the hour. And frugal innovation seems to be there in the DNA of every Indian because we have learned how to make do with very little. You know. So, so there, is, there is a lot of sense in terms of relocating R&D into India today. And what the Research Park is trying to do is to provide a conducive ecosystem which is you know, a, a very comfortable place for them to operate out of next to the um, academic fraternity. Now, if you look at what is it that the faculty is trying to do, and you, and you looked at you know, how, how can research be made me more meaningful, and I think that's, that's really the crux of the issue. There is a lot of research that is produced within academic institutions, but, but how relevant is it? is it? Is it centered around problems that the industry is seeking to solve? Now, co-locating the industry means that you actually look at problems that is relevant to the industry. So you focus your energies on doing research around these business-centric problems. So there's a lot of synergy between what the industry needs and the research that the academic institution is trying to do. And for the student, I think the advantages are obvious because it gives them a feel of real life problems, you know, and, and they can channelize their creative energies uh, either by taking the entrepreneurial route, and there is, there is a lot of, uh, uh, interest in that area today or by working with established companies and, and honing their skills by solving real life problems. Yeah. I want to touch on a subject uh, you know which um, is uh, two edged uh, because I'm also an Indian but I've lived here you know pretty much more than half of my life outside of India. Um, the successes of Indians outside of India obviously uh, are due to their fundamental that it's strong growing up but this country or any other western country but I, let's take example from here is you know the ecosystem exists here and more importantly i have as seen that many many successes uh, you know here are very humble in nature and the other side of the argument is well when you are growing and you are certainly in the burst of capitalism uh, you tend to be uh, you know taken away a little bit with the sudden influx of capital. So I think it's a matter of time when people get used to having one TV, two TVs, and three TVs, then they get tired of it. So humility will eventually come in. But from the cultural perspective, you just uh, mentioned that you know we come from a background where we apply extreme financial prudence uh, in our everyday lives. 
So the question I'm going to ask you is, the emerging entrepreneurs, the young students, when they take the entrepreneurial route, what is in their psyche now? Is it driven because they have to compete and show their competitiveness and their excellence to the world? Or do you think if we do this, then instead of you know, a small house in a small locality, I could go to a posh apartment in a posh locality, and then, you know, and so on and so forth. What is your take on this? You know, wealth creation is not a bad word. Sure. And, and I'm sure when you're young and energetic, that's, that's definitely a goalpost that you want to chase. Nonetheless, I think the manner in which the situation has changed, let's say 20 years back to what it is right now, Students of premier institutions have always had a choice. But the choice that was offered to them earlier was, you know, um, the choice between a nine to five job, A or B or C, and the difference could be the salaries that were offered. Because we simply didn't have an ecosystem that was quite conducive to entrepreneurship. You know. But today things are different. You know, there are humongous support systems available that ensure entrepreneurial success if you have the passion and the idea and the expertise to take an idea and convert it into a business opportunity. So youngsters today feel that, hey, it's important to make money, but here are the opportunities that I can go after. And actually I can channelize my energy into converting this opportunity into personal wealth, which I think is a phenomenal choice. And because they are smart enough, they know that they would like to do this ahead of the others. Because you know, if, if you're really looking to capitalize on the wealth at the bottom of the pyramid as forecasted by C.K. Prahalad, I think you need what is called native intelligence. You need to understand what works in the Indian context. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's really what is driving the youngsters to 